a most unprecedented period in our nation's history and our lifetime. The coronavirus pandemic is currently the greatest threat to human humanity, and none of us had a roadmap of experience to help navigate these uncharted waters. This is, however, not the first time a disease of epic proportions brought the world to a standstill or shut down entire economies. If we take a longer look at history, it will remind us that we were caught in a struggle for survival about 100 years ago. The Spanish flu of 1918 infected 500 million persons, or about one third of the world's population at the time. Unlike today, there were no effective vaccines available to arrest the spread. By the time it had run its course in April 1920, it is estimated to have killed as many as 100 million persons. Despite the availability of safe and effective vaccines today to help end this current pandemic, many are taking these life-saving pharmaceuticals for granted. Some are delaying receiving their first shot, while others are outright refusing to accept the vaccine despite clear scientific evidence to support their safety and efficacy. We are actually in a race against time to stop the virus from developing more variants and claiming more lives in the process. There is therefore no time to wait. The more people who are vaccinated, the sooner we can eliminate the virus. The pandemic is like a fire about to engulf your home. You must use the vaccines we have available now to put out the fire before it consumes you and your family. Turning a blind eye to reality does not eradicate the problem at hand. To date, more than 120 million persons are infected globally with COVID-19, and more than 2.7 million persons are dead. And before the pandemic is over, many more lives will be lost. We are still in the middle of a pandemic, recording another positive imported case today, bringing our total to 44, with now three active cases. We, however, have the tools to prevent the spread of this deadly virus and to limit the death toll by simply following the instructions based on science and acceptance of a vaccine that we know is safe and effective. Who is responsible for leading the fight? The virus threatens every element of society, including public health, social and political affairs, sports, education, trade and economics, agriculture and food security, industry and employment. The pandemic, therefore, is not merely a medical or health issue, and the problems created by it cannot be handled by any one governmental ministry. The Ministry of Health cannot and should not, therefore, be expected to be the only sector tasked with remedying the crisis. It requires the whole of government. So what is the whole of government approach? The whole of government approach means different government agencies with varying mandates working together to combat the common enemy, the COVID-19 virus, that threatens our lives and our livelihood. We therefore here have all the major ministries involved in fighting, including the ministries of health, finance, national security, education, sports, labor, industry and commerce, agriculture, tourism, and legal and justice. In the whole of government approach, it follows naturally that the prime minister or leader of the country is at the top of the decision-making process, guided by science and advice from the technical experts. It also follows that success in the fight would be attributed to the prime minister or leader of the country, and also any blame from the aftermath of any crisis arising. However, government alone or our leaders alone cannot stop the spread of the virus without the involvement of the whole of society. And so what is the whole of society approach? The World Health Organization recommended a whole of society approach in the fight against the virus, which means government engaging all stakeholders, including civil society, academia, the media, private sector, NGOs, other voluntary associations, communities, families, and individuals to strengthen the resilience of communities and society as a whole. It is essential to have community involvement at the core of the response. We therefore need to continue to take the message to every community across the Federation. 
I was happy, therefore, to have been engaged in a number of these community education campaigns in Boyd's, St. Johnson Village, and St. Paul's last week, and I look forward to participating in another in Otley's on Thursday this evening, as the Prime Minister just mentioned. My colleagues, Dr. Sebastian, Archibald, Offrey, and Osborne, and also Dr. Laws our CMO, were also involved in such campaigns across the Federation. Also, many doctors have been doing one-on-one -on -one consultations in their office. I congratulate the, the medical fraternity in assisting in the fight. If communities are engaged and empowered with knowledge needed to fight this virus, we will succeed because they will take the necessary measures to protect themselves. In this fight, the singular action of one affects all. Therefore, connecting with persons on an individual basis in their community, be it in their residence, workplace, or church, is crucial. From these community education sessions, hundreds of individuals come forward either at the time or days after and accept the vaccine. Just this afternoon, at an education session at a business establishment, we vaccinated 33 persons. We must continue these efforts as they are essential to our success in the war against the deadly virus. The COVID-19 task force has also engaged the Bar Association, the Doctors Association, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, Evangelical Association, Christian Council, Rotary Clubs, Trade and Labor Unions, Labor Department, and the three medical schools, Ross, Windsor, and UMHS. We have not only been involved in dialogue, but also in the formulation of a unified or common agenda on how government and the broader civil society can collaborate and work together in solving the issues related to the pandemic. The right information must be given at the right time to be effective and for people to understand the gravity of the situation and the appropriateness of the intentions needed, of the interventions needed. That is why our education program started in January 2020, way before the virus was declared a pandemic. We started providing the nation with information about this new or novel virus. We spoke to the signs and symptoms, mode of transmission, and severity of the disease, and consequences of inaction. We also made sure that all were educated on the non-pharmaceuticals, hand sanitizing, social distancing, and mask wearing needed in the fight. We warned that these measures would have to continue until a safe and effective vaccine was found, and that was the only way we can get out of this crisis. We never let up with our education and information sharing program coming to you every week at the COVID-19 briefings since the start of this pandemic. The first vaccines for COVID-19 were given in the UK in December 8th and in the United States December 14, 2020. The rest of the world began to have hope that vaccines would be available for all as the pharmaceutical companies began to step up their production. We here in St. Kitts and Nevis, like the rest of the world, began to step up our vaccine education program in a timely manner also. No one is safe until everyone is safe. And at this stage of the fight, public education on vaccines and vaccine acceptance is paramount. The onus must be on every one of us, however. We need all to contribute to minimize the health and socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. We need the combined strength, unity, and efforts of all in this fight if we are going to be successful. If there was ever a time when we needed all hands on deck, is now. You don't need a formal invitation to participate in the fight. You can use whatever platform you have to get the message out. In this era of fake news and misinformation, the media also must understand that they have a crucial role to play with balance and factual reporting so the public can be well informed. Now, our vaccine rollout started on the 22nd of February uh, this year. In just over three short weeks, we have vaccinated 6,903 persons, or 20.89% of the target population, with the first shot. This is a significant milestone for the people of the Federation, and they should be congratulated. We know that the first jab offers 76% efficacy, and it rises to 82% efficacy after the second shot. The effectiveness at preventing hospitalization, severe disease, and death is even higher as more persons get vaccinated and we reach herd immunity. The vaccine is free, safe, and effective, and available in all 11 health centers in St. Kitts and six in Nevis. I encourage all who are eligible for the vaccine to take advantage of the opportunity. Now, is the AstraZeneca vaccine safe? Health authorities in several countries, including Denmark, Norway, and Iceland, have suspended the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine following reports of the formation of blood clots 
in some persons who have been vaccinated. Also, France, Italy, Germany, and Austria have halted the use of a certain batch out of precaution. It is important to note that blood clots can occur naturally and are not uncommon. The World Health Organization said its advisory committee on vaccine safety is currently reviewing the reports. The WHO data shows that more than 268 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered worldwide with no serious side effects or deaths to date. They have continued to report that AstraZeneca is an excellent vaccine and that no causal relationship has been established between the shots and the health problems reported. The director of the National Board of Health in Denmark insisted that the 14-day suspension was a precaution while investigations were taking place. He said there is good evidence that the vaccine is both safe and effective. The European medical regulators say there is no indication that Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is linked to an increased risk of blood clots. It said the number of cases in vaccinated people was no higher than in the general population. There were 37 cases of persons who developed blood clots of 17 million persons in Europe who received the jab. Of note, 2% of persons who get COVID-19 develop blood clots. Of the 17 million who got the vaccine in Europe, 37 were found to develop blood clots, which is 0.0002%. In other words, currently, you are 10,000 times more likely to get a clot from the disease than the vaccine if it was associated uh, with the clots. This is why they say the benefits outweigh the risk. AstraZeneca released their report on Monday the 14th of March stating, and I quote, a careful review of all available data safety, I mean safety data of more than 17 million people vaccinated in the European Union with COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca has shown no evidence of an increased risk of pulmonary embolism deep venous thrombosis or thrombocytopenia in any defined age group, gender, batch, or in any particular country. The World Health Organization also on March 14th said, there is no evidence that the incidents are caused by the vaccine, and it is important that vaccination campaigns continue so that we can save lives and stem severe disease of the virus. My final advice, the recent breach at one of our quarantine facilities is a cautionary tale. Despite all the hard work we have done in containing the virus, everything can be lost by the actions of a few irresponsible individuals. We all must work together to keep our country safe. We must not hesitate and get vaccinated because despite all of our efforts, the virus will keep coming as it did today and will soon hitch a ride into our community and we can have community spread. The vaccine, however, is guaranteed to protect you. It can prevent you from getting sick, from getting severe disease, from being hospitalized, and more importantly, from dying. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilkinson.